Well, good morning. All right, glad to see everybody here. Glad you are joining us online this morning. My name is Walt Tanner, one of the pastors here at Capstone. And uh, this weekend, I was able to been able to hang out with our uh, middle schoolers and high schoolers. If you notice, there might be a few extra empty seats. Uh, we've got over 50 middle schoolers and high schoolers on fall retreat. They're getting ready to pack up and, and head home in a few minutes. And we've got about 20 of our youth uh, workers who are there. Uh, and it's just really exciting to see what God's doing in and through uh, our middle schoolers and high schoolers. If you have uh, if your students are there, I just want to tell you they're doing a great job. They've had a great time. Uh, been blown away just by even their note taking of when I would speak uh, last night and Friday night. They were writing everything down. And so you guys have modeled that really well. Or maybe they're modeling that for you guys really well. Uh, but they're doing really, really cool things. And one, one of the things about Capstone is sometimes a knock, sometimes not, but the, how young we are. And so if, you're, if you do math, kind of a healthy student ministry should make up about 10% of your population. Uh, at Capstone, it makes up about 20% of our population. Uh, then if you take another 30%, that's fifth grade and under, uh, close to half of our, our, our Capstone family is 18 years and younger, uh, which is an amazing thing because the future is bright in what God is doing in the disciples that we're raising up uh, through the ways of the Lord. The bad thing is they don't got jobs, all right? So just make sure y'all give at the, uh, at the offering month. Just kidding. But um, it's exciting what God is doing. Another thing we're really excited about is, uh, is our Eat, Pray, Stroll. Uh, we did this BC before Corona, and uh, we're bringing it back on Halloween. So October 31st, we encourage you guys. It's a great time. We, we, the church, this is not the church. The church is when we gather together. And so we're, gonna, uh, we're not going to meet here at 601 Fairview Street. We're going down to Depot Street. We'll say breakfast together. Uh, and then we're going to... We're going to break up and we're just going to walk down Main Street Fountain Inn and we'll have stations and we're praying for our city. And we hope that you would join us there. Uh, hopefully you just don't come to church to check it off a list, but, but let's take some time to go be the church. And, and so we'll be one service that, and we'll all be together. Uh, it be a really, really cool time just to really eat together, fellowship together, and really pray together of what it really means to be uh, the church and see our city transformed by the gospel. So today, let's get started with our message. So uh, we're continuing our Moses series. We're six, week in, six weeks in. We got a couple couple more weeks left. Uh, but kind of where we're at today is, is situational. And, and for you guys, have you ever found yourself uh, where you only have a bad choice? There's really no good choice. And, and there's only bad options. We have this phrase in America, uh, especially in the South, it's called between a rock and a hard place. And, and we say that, and, and as a, again, we really don't have a good way to get out. Uh, if you're new to uh, that, or as we say around here, if you ain't from around here uh, and you don't know what that means, here's the official definition up on the screen. It means you're in a difficult situation where you have to choose bet between two equally unpleasant courses of action. All right, so that's what it means to be between a rock and a hard place. So there's two options and neither, neither one of them great. All right, I like to know where sayings come from. So I kind of looked up this saying. Uh, most people believe it came from New Mexico in 1917 uh, when some miners organized uh, a union. Uh, they went to the bosses and said, hey, we want higher pay. Uh, we need conditions to get better. We're not going to work. Uh, and the management said, nope. And so they found themselves, as they said, between a rock and a hard place because they either had to have low pay in, in uh, not safe conditions or be unemployed and live in poverty. So neither one of those were great choices. And so they came up with this phrase saying, hey, you kind of put us between a rock in a hard place. Uh, to kind of fast forward a little bit more current situation, uh, there was a guy named uh, Aaron Ralston uh, several years ago, and he found himself between literally a rock and a hard place. He was, he was rock climbing all by himself, uh, in, ends up getting wedged between two boulders, uh, and is there for several days and ultimately has to make a decision, either wait there and die or take out a dull pocket knife and cut part of your arm off in order to survive. From the picture, you see what he did, right? And so he literally found himself. He said, neither one of these choices is good. Either die or cut a limb off, right? That is the literal form of going, man, this is between a rock and a hard place. And so today, as we talk about Moses and Israel, they find themselves between a rock and a hard place. And, and what we're going to learn is that they find themselves there, but God has actually led them there. And what happens when God leads you to a, uh, a, a dead end? What happens when God leads you to one of these rocks between a hard place where you had neither one of your situations is good? How will you respond and what will you do? 
So before we get to kind of this cul-de-sac in the wilderness, uh, which is going to be in Exodus 14, if you have your Bibles, you go ahead and turn there. But let me kind of fill in the gaps between last week and this week. So last week was Exodus 4. Uh, it's Moses and the burning bush. We talked about the burn notice and the idea that uh, the burning bush informs Moses that God says, hey, I want you to be the one to go and free uh, the people of Israel, the Hebrew slaves. Uh, he makes excuses, but ultimately he makes a way. And so he goes to Pharaoh. Pharaoh is not a fan of this plan. Uh, he tells him no. Uh, they go back and forth. So God fights back with Pharaoh and, and they have these 10 plagues. We're not going to really jump into that, but it's the final plague, uh, which is the, basically the, the Passover or the angel of death. And, and Moses is given instructions from God. He says, hey, here's what I need you to do. Tell the nation of Israel to go and kill a, a lamb and to take his blood and put him on the doorpost. And the angel of death will come through, and, and if you don't have the blood over your doorpost, then you will lose your firstborn son. And this comes true, and uh, Pharaoh loses his firstborn son, and this is kind of the, the straw that breaks the camel's back. And he ends up, says, fine, get out of here. I'm tired of dealing with you. I'm grieving. You guys get out of here. And Moses has told them, said, hey, as soon as this happens, the next morning, God has said that we will be free. So have your stuff ready to go. So sure enough, that happens. They head to out into the desert. Now, as they go into the desert, they don't go directly. So if you know your geography, there's Egypt, and then they were supposed to go this way. Well, they don't go directly westward because they were Philistines, and they were, they were some pretty gnarly pagan tribes that they would have to fight. And God's like, eh, we're not really ready for that yet. So he takes them south. And so he's kind of, one, they're wandering kind of in the desert and, and they're going down into the south. And so as they do that, uh, they begin to be led by God. So let's talk about how God led him. So let's look at, um, I told you Exodus th uh, 14, but we're actually going to read a couple verses in 13. So right above 14 in verses 21 and 22, it says this. It says, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar cloud to lead them along the way, and by night a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. And the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. So as they leave, as they leave uh, Egypt, actually the city of Ramsey was the capital at that point. So as they leave, they see this giant pillar of, uh, of smoke, of fire, and they say, hey, Moses is like, that's God. The visible image of the invisible God, he's going to lead us. So they began following him. And they were like, man, this is pretty cool. It's, it's pretty solid. Like wherever the cloud goes, that's where we go. So if he turns left, we turn left. He goes right, we go right, we stop. And so it, it's a beautiful thing. I, there are probably some of us who wish we had a, a cloud that led us where we needed to go. And, and so wherever we went somewhere, there was a cloud knowing we're going in the right direction. Guys, okay, this is the person you're supposed to marry. Sorry, um, pick him up for a date. There's a giant cloud behind me that's messing up your hair, but it's telling me that I'm supposed to marry you. All right, so this is, this is it. Are right, you go and go, you go to that job interview and, and there's a tornado above the building. Like, all right, this is the job you're supposed to take. So the idea of it may be really cool if we had this pillar of cloud that kind of led us us through life, but we don't have that. We have the Holy Spirit, but that's another sermon for another day. But so as they do that, they have this leading them through the desert. Well, they go south and they end up coming to the end of the Nile. And, and so they go to the end of the river and the pillar of fire just stops. Moses says, all right, guys, God says, we're going to hang out right here. Uh, they're probably about 75 to hundred miles away. So they've been walking uh, for three or four days. They've been hoofing it through day and through night. And so they're finally like, ah, oh, we can rest by the water. We can take a deep breath. So they think things are pretty good. What they don't know is that God is poking and waking Pharaoh up from his grief. He wakes up going, what in the world did we just do? We just let all of our free slave labor leave. That is unacceptable. He says, hey, rally the troops. Let's get every soldier, every horse, every chariot, which equaled a tank in those days. He said, we're going after these Hebrew slaves and they're going to pay for what they've done to us. And we are going to drag them back here and we are going now. So as they, as, so they're like, anyway, they're lost in the, they're lost in the desert. They should have went this way, but they went south. We'll catch up to them easily. So they do. Within about a day, they catch up to them. And uh, Israel's kind of chilling out by the river. I mean, maybe they're playing in the water, but all of a sudden they start hearing like thunder. So they think a storm is coming. They're like, hey guys, kind of get in. It looks like a storm's coming. They, they begin to see dust on the horizon. They're like, man, this, this is going to be a bad one. And then they begin to see, no, 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 that's not a storm. That is the wrath of the Egyptians. Egyptian army coming to get us. And they look around and they understand that they are trapped. 
They're between a rock and a hard place. And so when you're trapped and in, in, in you don't really know what to do and when none of your options are good, normally what we like to do is blame other people. So that's exactly what they do. So look at verse 11 and we'll see in uh, chapter 14, we'll see their response. So verse 11 says this, it says, and they said to Moses, is this because there are no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? People don't say there's sarcasm in the Bible. That's sarcasm, all right? There were graves in Egypt, and they go, were there not enough graves that we got to come all the way out here to die? He says, what have you done in bringing us out of Egypt? This is not, is this not what we said back in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. So ultimately they're saying, look, this is your fault. We had this talk before we left. We said we'd rather serve in, uh, Egyptians and die here, old men and women, than to run out into the desert. And now we're going to get slaughtered. There's going to be a massacre in this because we have literally nowhere to go. But yet the fire the pillar of fire stands still because here's the thing. They're exactly where God wants them to be. They're exactly where God wants them to be. You see, Moses had led them there and, God, and Moses had experienced and, and he had trusted God. He, remember, he's 80 years old and we've talked about how the first 40 years and the next 40 years and had been preparing for this. So he's, he's trusting God in this. He goes, well, guys, if the pillar of fire has led us here, there's probably a pretty good reason. And they're amazed that, he's, that he is, uh, he's calm and they don't understand why he's not panicking and he's not running. And he just kind of looks to the pillar and he kind of smiles and, and, the, pillar, and the fire is kind of making his hair blow. And they go, yeah, we followed a crazy guy to our death into the desert. We don't really know what's going to happen. We're pretty much going to die here. All right, so let's keep reading. And he says in some really good words of advice, not only for Israel thousands of years later, but advice we need to hear in 2021. This is what it says uh, in verse 13. He says, And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation which he will work or fight for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you'll never see again. They're like, great, yeah, I know, because we're about to die. Says, the Lord will fight for you, and you will have only to be silent. So Moses is saying, hey guys, God has you here, right here, right now for this purpose. Because he's about to show you, not only has he, he delivered you out of Egypt, not only has he guided you here, but he is now about to fight for you. I'm going to say that again. That not only has he guided them there, not only has he delivered them, but he has brought them there to fight and some of us need to hear what exactly instructions he gave them. He says, look, don't fear, stand firm, be silent, and watch God fight. Don't fear, be silent, stand firm, and watch God fight. Too many times we find ourselves between a rock and a hard place and we, we, we don't really know what to do and we blame God or we blame others or, you know, we, we might have put ourselves there, but ultimately going, hey, what do we do next? Do we panic? Do we make excuses? Because ultimately Israel had to learn that, that God fought, will fight for them in this journey because God had heard their cries God had seen their brokenness, and now God was delivering them and fighting for them. God says, I am a God that fights for justice. Now remember, this is 400 years of justice that is now about to come out. There's some of us who, we've had wrongs against us, and we're like, okay, we want them to pay now. But the justice that God may deliver on people may not be on this side of eternity. We have to understand that. But God says, I am a God of justice, and I will fight, and I am fighting for you. So Moses, again, he doesn't panic. He doesn't, he doesn't freak out. Remember, he's been through a lot. He's, he, the last year with Pharaoh, he's gone back and forth with him, and God has, has delivered him time and time again. But Israel, that's less experienced with this living God, this Yahweh, they don't really know how to react. And so they act in a way, again, like Israel, like we do. And, and isn't it amazing how when we act like this, there are older men and women who are seasoned, who have been through these situations, and, and they're the ones to look at us and go, hey, hey, young fella, 
The sky is not falling. Or, or, or hey, hey, sister, I, I know that you, that you feel like it's, this, these days are never going to end. I can tell you they will. That is those who have more experience, those who have a better perspective, who sometimes have to calm some of us down because they live through a depression and a recession. They've lived through raising kids. They lived through losing jobs. They've lived through loving, losing loved ones. They've, they've been that and say, I know it hurts right now, but I've experienced it. I have perspective. So let me help you guide you through this. And that's what Moses is doing. Moses say, look, I, I, I've hung out with this God. I've had conversations with him in the desert. And, and as we were in Pharaoh's palace, like God's done amazing things. Trust me, the sky is not falling. And ultimately, God says, hey, do you have a Moses in your life? Do you have an older man or older woman who you can go to? And and when you think you're between a rock and a hard place and you don't really have any perspective and you can only see those two bad options that that guy might say or that lady might say, hey, you know what? There are two bad options. You don't feel like there's any good options, but there might be this God option. And some of us might need to hear that. And and that's what Moses says. He says, look, don't fear, stand firm, be silent and watch God fight. So verses 15 through 18, we don't have time, but uh, really God has a conversation with Moses. Hey, Moses, here's what we're going to do. All right, so I'm going to tell you to, to raise your hand up. And then the, the, you, see that, you see that whole C right there? I'm going to split it in two and make it a highway. Now, a lot of us think, yeah, that's what he's going to do. Moses, it's not like Moses has ever seen that before. He's like, so you, say that again, God. What are you going to do? He's like, I'm going to split the C wide open. I'm going to make it a highway. And you guys are going to book it across the other end. Moses is like, all right. And so they have that conversation and he begins to kind of prepare them for what's going on. And God says, look, there will be a massacre today, but the massacre will not be my family. The massacre will be my enemy. They will know that I am, I am, that I am Yahweh, that I am the God of Abraham and Jacob, and I am a God not to be messed with. There will be a massacre, but it will not be my family. It will be my enemy. All right, so let's read. This is an important part of the story in verse 19. It says, The angel of, the, uh, angel of God who was going before them, that, that pillar of fire and smoke, the host of Israel moved and went behind them. And the, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. And so, oh, in verse 20, And coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel, and there was a cloud in the darkness, and it was lit up at night and without anyone coming near and the other at night. So we begin to see here that this cloud goes from in front of them out by the water to behind them. Now, ultimately, this is what God is saying. He's like, hey, I'm going to cover you from behind, or hey, I've got your six. I said that one time to Betsy. She said, what are you talking about? Got my what? And I said, well, you know, it's a cool term for me. I'm not going to let bad guys get you, okay? I got your back. I'm not going to let anybody sneak up on you. I've got your six. And so that means that there's, nobody's going to get you from behind. And so understanding that, that they go, all right, well, let's, what does that mean? Why would God do that? There's several reasons. One, that he didn't want uh, Israel to see how big this army was behind them. Two, he didn't want Eat the Egyptian army to see what he was doing on the other side of that cloud. And three, he didn't want Egypt to pursue them yet. He wanted them to get to the other side. So he basically blocks their way. He fights for them and says, all right, I'm going to let my people go. And you're going to stay right here at bay because I've got their back. I'm not going to let anything happen to them. And then verse 14 I mean, verse 21 says this, Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong wind all night. That's important. They didn't go yet. They didn't go to morning. But all night that wind was blowing. Why? To make the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went in the midst of the sea on dry ground, and the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and their left hand. And so this wind blows all night, and this is important because it spreads them out, but ultimately it dries, it dries the ground. So it's not a muggy, sloppy mess, but it's dry. So they can run. So they can hightail it to the other side. And so all night this wind is blowing. All night this is going. And then ultimately Moses in the morning says, all right, now you guys can go. And this pillar continues to cover Israel 6 they're not, while they're crossing But once they move, once they're over and they're on the West Bank, it says the cloud then removes itself. And Pharaoh falls for the trap. Pharaoh's like, all right, let's go. 
And they kind of look at each other going, yeah, let's go. So they go across and then we see instructions and he says, all right, now that as soon as you see them coming, once they're halfway, he says, lower your hand and the waters and judgment of justice will fall upon them. And ultimately they will be crushed. And again, they will know that I am, I am. And so as we hear this story of being between a rock and a hard place and, and say my options are I'm going to get, I'm either going to get killed by the Egyptian army or I'm going to drown in the sea, God provides a third way out. It's not a good way, but a God way. And here they're able to see the glory of the power of God. And as they waited, they were just like, man, this God is powerful. This God is good. This God cares for us. Archaeologists actually have discovered evidence in, in hieroglyphics, hieroglyphics, I don't think that's the right word, but that it says they didn't actually go back to the Red Sea. Egyptians didn't even touch the Red Sea for seven years. That's not Bible, that's what they found. It says they actually didn't even cross the Red Sea for 25 years. God had gotten his point across. He was not a God to be messed with. And here we see Israel now begins a new journey into the wilderness. And next week, we'll, we'll begin to talk more about that. So what does this mean for you and for me? What can we learn from Israel? And what can we learn how Moses led them through this, this great divide, this, this city, this, this sea that has been separated? So three quick things. One is this. They waited for instructions. They waited for instructions. Our natural tendency is when we find ourselves between a rock and a hard place is either we want to run. And so we want to run out into the, we're like, well, I can escape this way. And either the army's going to get you or the desert's going to get you. Or we try to fix it ourselves. Like, all right, well, let's see. Can we make a boat, Ken? Is there something we can do? But ultimately, God said, no, 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 you need to wait. Don't be afraid. Be still. Watch in silence as God fights for you. And they waited for instructions. Now, it didn't say that they enjoyed it. They didn't say it wasn't easy. They didn't say that they didn't squirm. They didn't say that they didn't have fear, but they waited. They waited on God to move in a mighty way. And as they waited, guess what? As they, they learned that their God was going to fight for them, that the, the pillar went in between them, uh, between the army and them, they learned that this God was going to fight for them. And they, they learned that their, their faith grew. Their trust grew. And there's sometimes that God might be asking you to wait on instruction in order for your faith to grow, you know, for your trust to grow. Or do you want to try to fix it yourself? Again, times, there are times we need to act, but there's also times we need to wait. Most of our spiritual lives are more like a microwave. We, we, want, we want food really quick. And God said, well, my ways are, are sometimes more like crock pots. Sure, we could get it faster in the microwave, but it's not as good. It's just sitting for eight hours, that roast and just fall off the bone, good stuff in the crock pot. And God says, hey, that's what I want for you. I don't want the cheap plastic stuff for you. So let, my, let, let your faith grow. Let your trust grow in me as you wait for instructions. Next, they walk through. So once we get those instructions, the, the next question is, do we have the courage to walk through? Because I guarantee you there, were, there was a wife going, I am not walking through that. Do you know that will do to my shoes? Do you know what that water's going to do to my hair? I am not. That thing could come crashing down on us. You crazy. I will wait. I will fight those fellas before I walk through that. And a husband said, picked her up and said, we running. All right. All right there, were some, there were some kids that were looking, mama, I, no, uh -uh, I don't like water. I'm not running through that. And mamas had to pick up babies and they had to run because that was scary. The idea that there is a, a four story wall of water on either side of you and you've got to go through it. There were men and women who were fearful. There were, there were children who were refusing to go, and people literally had to pick them up to get them to the other side. So the question is, do we have the courage to walk through whatever way God gives us? Because it doesn't say that God's ways are going to be easy, because your ways that he calls you to might be scary, like walking through a literal sea. Or it might be costly. It might not make sense. But do we have the courage to walk through that when God says, okay, you waited for instruction. I'm giving you instruction. Now will you have the courage to go? You know, the New Testament, our, our walk with Jesus is often called a journey. In Matthew 7, 14, he says, look, there's two roads. There's the broad road and the narrow road. The broad road is easy and there, there, there are tons of people on it. He said, but there's a narrow road. It's my way. It's narrow and it's difficult and it's hard. And I'll be real honest. There are a few who find it. So will you go... Will you walk through the ways that God provides for you? Because ultimately, 
when we see those, a lot of times those instructions come from here. And if we're really honest, do we really live our lives and walk the way this tells us? Scripture is here. I'm not telling you this way is the, the way to have the most friends or the most stuff or the easiest life. But ultimately, the God who created us says, hey, here, this is the best possible life to bring glory to me and what that looks like. All right, and then there's, so we've got the idea that we waited for instruction, we walked through uh, the way of God, and then we watched God work. So can you imagine as they get to the West Bank and, and they're probably up on a hill and, and they're all lining, to all two million of them, and they see this army coming and then all of a sudden they just see Moses start lowering his hand and they begin to see those waters come crashing down. And, and, and what comes over them is they just in silence are going, whoa, wow. And then they begin to cheer and they begin to sing praises to this God. And, and they begin to just understand that they've watched God work because they had the patience to wait for instruction. They had the courage to walk through. And then ultimately, they got to watch God work. I've been doing ministry now for, for almost 20 years. And it's amazing when, when I get to see God work, when I get to see God God redeem lives and, and heal families and begin to see life from death. That when you're able to see God work, it really does transform your life and what it means. But here's the thing. If you decide to run out into the desert because you think you can fix it yourself, or you decide to make your own raft, you're going to miss what God does. So don't just try to figure it out yourself, but go to those Moseses, go to those men and women, go to those who have perspective and begin to go, hey, tell me how God worked when you lost your job. Hey, tell me how God worked when you couldn't pay your bills. Tell me how God worked when you and your wife wanted to kill each other. Tell me how you worked when you raised a teenager. Tell me how you've watched God work and I need to learn because right now I don't see him working in my life. And we can testify time and time again how many of us who've stood on the other side have watched God do miracles and watched God do only what God can do. All right, so here's your big idea. It's pretty easy. It's just this. It's the great divide of the great sea allow God to show his people and us what he can do when we wait, when we walk, and when we watch. It allows us to see when we just simply wait, we have the courage to walk, and then we get to see Watch God work. Today, do you find yourself between a rock and a hard place? You don't really see any good options. You're like, okay, God, now what? There's a lot of times in the last 18 months, we've all gone, now what? What am I supposed to do now? What, what am I supposed to do with my job? What am I supposed to do with my kids? What am I supposed to do with my friends? What am I supposed to do with this person who doesn't think like me? What am I supposed to do with this political unrest? What am I supposed to do? We don't really know what to do. And we begin to go, okay, God, I just don't need a good response. I need a God response. I need one of these miracles. And I hope we would hear and, and we would see even in this, we would listen to the Lord and the Lord would say, hey, I've got your six. I've got your back. That if you simply wait, here's what's going to happen. If you have the courage to walk, then here's what's going to happen. Man, you're going to get to see me work in a way like you've never seen before. So will we wait for a way? Now, for some of you, you may already know the way, but you don't have the courage to go. For some of you, you need to go, all right, I, I, I need the courage to move forward in a Christ-like manner. What does that look like in your life? Stay in community. Don't run because it gets really hard. Stay in community. Stay in fellowship because it, it says millions of people went across. The people who scattered didn't make it. Stay in community. Stay with your tribe. Don't run. Wait. Don't refuse. Walk. Don't look to yourself, but watch God work. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you now, and again, this Exodus 14, 13 just stands out so much to me today, that Moses looks to these people who are panicking and who are full of fear, and he says, don't fear. He says, stand firm, be silent, and watch our God fight. God, I know you're fighting for so many in this room, even right now. God, they don't know it. 
They don't know how you are fighting for them, but God, you are making a way that you are tearing down walls, that you are building relationships, that God, you are working in mighty ways for each, for our brothers and sisters, for your sons and for your daughters. But God, we may not see that for a while. Do we have the patience to wait? Or God, there may be some who they know exactly what they need to do, but they don't have the courage to walk. So God, I pray that you would fill them with courage to, to be able to walk across the sea on dry land. Or God, it may be that you need to send someone to lift them up because they refuse. So sometimes you've got to pick us up. But God, I also pray for those who, who need to see you work. Lord, I pray that you would just give them just little pieces of, of goodness. And that might be a scripture. It, it might be a word of encouragement. It, it might be something to go their way that, that only you can do. Lord, there are also people in this room who they are, they know people who are between a rock and a hard place right now. So Lord, I pray that they would lift them up by name. Maybe send them a scripture. God, you haven't called us just to come to church and, and check this off our list, but you've called us to move forward. So for the message that we've heard today, how is this empowering us to go out? How is this empowering your church, our community, our tribe to watch you work? God, we often say we're missionaries where we work, learn, live, and play. So God, I pray that they would take this and they would see that you're fighting for us. And yeah, we can look at culture and go, man, we are losing the culture war. And you might be going, that's exactly where I need you, church. We might be thinking that things can't get much worse. And God said, well, this might be where I need you to shine brighter. So God, may we not blame others. May we not make excuses. But may we listen. And may we wait. And may we have the courage to walk. And God, then let's just watch you and praise you as you work. In your son's holy name we pray. Amen. We are so glad that you joined us this morning online to worship with our Capstone family. Again, here is our big idea. The great divide of the great sea allowed God to show his people and us what he can do when we wait, walk, and watch. In life, we find ourselves like Israel between a rock and a hard place. The question is, how will we respond? Will we blame others for us being there? Will we wait for instructions? Will we walk through the difficult places to get through the other side? The nation of Israel had to trust Moses and his relationship with the Lord. Make sure that you have a Moses who you can trust to help guide you when you find yourself between a rock and a hard place. Again, thanks for watching online. We would love to connect with you. You can connect via our social media platforms, our website, capstonechurch.net, or we would love to see you in person at one of our future gatherings. You guys are sent out.